Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. Though the busy summer season in the national park system seems to be winding down, management planning seems to be as robust as ever across the parks. In the past week, the Traveler reported on efforts by the National Park Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to develop a plan for helping the recovery of grizzly bears in the North Cascades of Washington State. We also noted that Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve and the West Norwegian Fjords World Heritage Site just recently signed a sister park agreement. At Glacier National Park in Montana, staff is working on a plan to better manage the Going to the Sun Road corridor, while the Missouri National Recreational River staff in South Dakota and Nebraska finalized their plan for managing the 800 or so acres of Goat Island, which is located in the channel of the Missouri River near Vermilion, South Dakota. You can find those and other stories about national parks at nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, I talk with Stephanie Spira about her research into fall foliage colors at Acadia National Park, while Erica Zambello discusses the fate of the Bahama parrot with Carolyn Stahala after Hurricane Dorian leveled critical habitat areas. And we get a quick update on the fate of legislation to take a large bite out of the national park system's $12 billion maintenance backlog. Where is the best unit of the national park system in the east to catch the fall colors? Is it New River Gorge National River in West Virginia? The Blue Ridge Parkway as it rolls from Virginia to North Carolina. What about Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee and North Carolina? Or maybe Acadia National Park in Maine? Frankly, all are pretty good locations. And in the weeks ahead, many folks will be looking at projections for when the leaf peeping will peak in each of those parks. For Stephanie Spira, an assistant professor of geography at the University of Richmond and a 2019 Second Century Stewardship Fellow at the Skudik Institute at Acadia, a question she's trying to answer is whether the fall color season is sliding. Is it showing up later at Acadia? Is it lasting longer? Spira is conducting research in a bid to answer those questions and joins us today. Welcome to The Traveler, Stephanie. Hi, Kurt. How are you? I'm doing well. Appreciate you joining us today. In in looking at your research, um, recently you put out a call for citizen scientists, if you will, or, or just park visitors to um, submit photos they might have taken in, in falls gone past from Acadia National Park to help you with your research. And at the same time, you're also using, I, I believe, some satellite imagery and, and whatnot. So your research is kind of a, a mix of technological science and citizen science. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, that's totally right. Um, We are trying to, well, we want to understand how, as you said in that wonderful introduction, how fall foliage has changed over time. Is the peak starting later? Are the colors more or less vibrant? Is it lasting? Do we have two weeks of a great season? Do we have one week of a great season? And how is climate change affecting that? So what's great is we have satellite data from at least the past 20 years to help us answer those questions, but we don't have any great reliable data from before 2000. And we actually also need help um, with post-2000, trying to understand if the signals we see in the satellites are what's actually happening on the ground. So we're asking anyone who's been to Acadia National Park in the fall, and hundreds and thousands of people have been to Acadia National Park in the fall, to send us photos to actually help us with this, putting together this time series of when fall foliage has happened since the 1950s on. And I guess one of the, one of the questions this begs is, does it really matter? Is this a, an economic development um, project to help uh, the, the tourist industry in, in Bar Harbor um, figure out when it needs to hire staff? Or is it a, a park service management question that needs to be answered? Why, why do we need to know whether the, the season is, is getting later or lasting shorter? Oh, so many reasons. So first one is true economically. I think cruise ship traffic for fall foliage brings in the last figure I saw came out in 2016 brings $20 million into Bar Harbor alone. And that's just mostly September and October. 
tourism is like one out of six jobs in Maine are with tourism. I mean, leaf keeping in New England is a billion dollar industry. And in Bar Harbor, things sort of shut down after Columbus Day slash Indigenous Peoples Day. I am not sure which day it is called in Maine. And if the season is getting later, that might actually affect when stores and hotels decide how long they're going to stay open, when they're going to do peak rates, all of those things. And as you said, park management wise, actually September and October, the shoulder season, because most people visit, visit national parks in the summer, visitor numbers have doubled since the early 90s in September and October in Acadia too. So if more people are coming to the park, if more people are coming later, park management really has to think about what the implications for more visitors during this, what we consider a slower time would be. So it's economic implications, it's tourism, it's park management, it's climate change, it's all the things in one. <laughs> now, you recently put out a call for family photos depicting fall colors in Acadia. First of all, what sort of response have you been seeing? And, and secondly, what are you looking for in those photos? Yeah, so we've been seeing um, a good response. I'm getting a lot of post-2000s photos a lot more recently, which makes sense if you're thinking about technology. We all have data, we all have photos on our phone, and they're so much easier to collect and send. And they're great. They're super helpful. We're putting them on the Instagram. It's at A&P Fall Foliage. Um, and they're going to be really helpful. But I'm super, super hoping some people will scan in old photos that have little dates in the corner. Remember when you used to take a picture and you have to go get it developed? I'm, sure. And I understand that this is a much bigger ask because it's not just sitting on your hard drive or on your computer. But they could be so, so helpful in helping us piece together when fall foliage occurred over time because we can see the trees in the picture so what we're looking for i mean we'll take anything but we're basically looking for like your family in front of vistas like in front of jordan pond on top of cadillac on the bubbles in front of eagle lake anything that has a bunch of if you're not your family's not in them that's also fine that works too might be a little better but we can crop you out if your family's in them (laughs) Uh Uh you'll get cropped out we don't need you for science but it might be a cute picture for the instagram Do you try to pinpoint where in the park those shots were taken? I mean, obviously there are some some iconic vistas that, you know, you can tell right off where it was taken. But, um, you know, if somebody's going along the, the carriage roads and, and takes a picture, um, do you want to know where along the carriage roads that picture was taken? Well, uh, it would be, if you can remember that, that would be amazing. So most of the newer pictures we've been getting, a lot of them are actually geotagged because they were taken on a cell phone, which is great because they actually say where exactly in the park the picture was taken. But if you have these old photos that are scanned in, even if you can just kind of remember sort of where in the park it is, right? So like Cadillac, we, 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 there, it's, a, it's an iconic photo, right? Jordan Pond, iconic photo. Door Mountain, iconic photo. Um, if you can give us a general range but we have almost no data points from that time period so we're just i'm i'm looking for anything anyone wants to send in (laughs) well and it it would help if they knew the date and where it was taken yeah those are two very great things that would be very helpful you you point out an interesting fact in, in that there are no past no baseline for you to compare it to is there not that i know of but if one of your listeners does so there are some old reports that I can that I've got some old um, like Forest Service reports. I'm digging through some of the old published like USDA literature, those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but not there's no time series in a way that I would. There's no one who wrote a journal that was like, or if there is, I would love to know about it. It's like October fifteenth, half of the colors have changed. Right, that's my dream to find that journal. <laughs> but we're gonna try and use pictures and hope people really want to engage in this project and be willing to scan photos, which I understand is a process. So, so how many years do you have to analyze photos before you can come away with a confident statement of, yes, the, the fall foliage is peaking later, or, or no, there is no change in, in when it's peaking? Well, thankfully, we have the satellite, so we can at least get 20 years of data, which we should be able to disentangle some signal. So just I've done some very in, some initial analyses, and it actually looks like um, the season is moving by half a day. Just over these 20 years, there's a clear trend line. But the more data we get, the better. I mean, if we can get back until 30 years would be great, 40 years would be amazing, 50 years would be bonkers. But 30 years, if we can get from the 90s on, even that would be ideal. How, how many photos have you um, seen submitted so far? Do you know? Have someone submitted 
a Google uh, cloud box of photos. She's been going to Acadia every, I think she lives in Bar Harbor. Um, that's amazing. We, I usually get about five a day. The call went out last week. We probably have around, along with these, this folder of photos that I have 500 of, probably have an additional 100. Okay, so uh, We only have one from before. We have one photo from 1987, and that's the only thing we have before the year 2000. So I'm looking for those. Yeah, well, maybe you should offer a prize for the oldest uh, fall foliage photo from Acadia. Do you have an idea about what the prize could be? Um, that I could afford? <laughs> a, a lifetime subscription to nationalparkstraveler.org. I would, yeah. Is that, I, anyone can click on that, right? Yeah, it's free. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just wondering with the photos coming in, how, how do you sort them on and do you sort them in terms of um, by calendar year, I guess, huh? Yes, I have a lovely student working for me. Her name is Olivia Hubert. She is fantastic. She is my um, undergraduate working, or she actually graduated from the University of Richmond in 2019. So she's doing some um, part-time work for me and she is sorting all of it and she's creating spreadsheets and maps and being amazing. <laughs> wow. When, when do you anticipate having um, some initial results or is this? Kurt, that's the worst question you can ask a scientist. Um, <laughs> definitely after the fall. We're going to wait through the fall foliage season because we're putting signs up in the park now. Well, I'm going up to Maine um, next weekend, actually, to put some signs up in the park to ask for visitors now to think about this. Yeah. Yeah. We've been talking today with uh, Stephanie Spira. She's an assistant professor at the University of Richmond, um, working on a fall foliage study at Acadia National Park to discern whether the peak foliage season is sliding one way or another. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Grant Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grant Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at www.gtnpf.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. We're back with Stephanie Spira. Um, she's studying fall foliage at uh, Acadia National Park in Maine and really needs your help out there to um, send her family photos of fall settings in Acadia National Park if you have them, uh, preferably prior to the year 2000. Now, Stephanie, you're also designating photo stations around Acadia for volunteers to take pictures. Is that, is that right? How does that work? Yep. Um, I'll be going up there next. Friday, so what is the 19th, I think, around that. And we're putting signs up just in four locations that we know are frequently trafficked in Acadia and also are just beautiful views. You're going to be taking a picture there anyway. So it's just a sign that says, hey, I know you're taking a picture of this beautiful view in front of you. There's going to be one on the top of Cadillac, one on the deck of Jordan Pond, um, one at Otter Cove, one at this um, beautiful wayside that says, changing of the seasons on the park loop road that looks right out into door mountain and it just gives instructions it says hey if you take a photo could you email it to anp fall foliage at richmond.edu and tell us where you are because we're going to use that for science and also send us your old photos because what's an interesting thing about the demographics of acadia is that usually visitors this is not their first time to acadia um a good number of visitors this is their fourth or fifth or sixth time to acadia so I, people have been coming for years and years and years it's an interesting national park in that way. It's a little bit different than um, like Yellowstone or Yosemite. So 
I want those photos from those repeat visitors. So I'm hoping these signs will not only encourage them to send the pictures they take on this trip, but encourage them to think about pictures they've taken, potentially taken in the past if this is not their first time to the park. Sure. And and how long will those photo stations remain? I mean, is it just this fall or next fall? Yeah, this fall and next fall. Yep. Okay. Now you mentioned a, an Instagram feed. Is it is that someplace people can can look today to see what some of the photos that you've received already? Yeah, there it's updated daily, and I also have people at Scudic taking some pictures. So you can we're doing a fall foliage watch. There's it currently looks pretty green at Eagle Lake right now in uh, 2019. But yeah, you can go and there it's fun. I mean, Acadia is beautiful, and I think this just also I'm just gonna push for Acadia has beautiful fall foliage. I think it's great. <laughs> you, you sound like an ambassador for the park. Yeah, I, I, it's my favorite national park. So, uh, and what, what's that Instagram address? It's at A N P Fall Foliage. So, like Acadia National Park, but A N P Fall Foliage. That's it. Okay. Uh, no Facebook page. Oh, no Facebook page. Should I do a Facebook page? I'm a millennial. <laughs> well, but, but but Facebook page Maybe. you can you can enlarge the photos. Enlarge That's the true. photos. Ugh. Maybe I'll do that. I will let you know if that is a thing I can do, if that is a thing that gets done. Yeah. That's a great idea. Now, and a part of your research touches on climate factors like rainfall and temperature. What role or roles do they play in the fall colors? Yeah. So different species respond a little bit differently to different stressors and different species of trees have different pigmentation. So you have a lot of things happening at once. But basically, a few studies have shown that a lot of rain in the autumn and heat stress will actually decrease vibrancy of colors. Um, elevated nitrogen concentrations, which comes from pollution, actually can decrease how red maples are. Um, storms, you have, you get a beautiful fall color if you have a big storm, all the leaves are on the ground. But also, um, warmer spring, summers, and autumns, they actually delay when the leaves start to turn. And then if you have, the one thing people talk about a lot is if you have bright sunny days with cool but not freezing nights, that is great for the production of this pigment called anthocyanin. And that's what makes maples look really, really, really red. Um, so you have so many different things happening at the same time. But weather and climate and pigmentation and pollution, they all interact to affect what, how vibrant your colors are when they start and when they end. We're going to try and add to the literature that is trying to disentangle these things. I was going to say, it sounds like you have an awful lot to tease out between all those various factors. It's not just a matter of sitting down and looking at pretty um, family photos. Yeah, so we're going to be taking a very broad view, like a top-down view of this. Um, so we're just going to look at, in overall, when is fall foliage starting? When is it reached its 50% peak? And when is it? when do the leaves fall off the tree? But there's a lot of work do it, being done at the species-specific level, and hopefully this work can then inform future work to actually see, okay, what's happening with the birches versus what's happening with the red maples versus the sugar maples. Um, yeah, because it's so many different things that are, that affect those colors and when they occur. But broadly, temperature and rain do play a role in the start and how much, and how vibrant they are. Any, any projections for this fall? No, it's, I was told it was pretty chilly in Maine already. So I'm expecting it to be pretty early. I don't know. I do want some color up there next week. But that'd be really early. I think it peaked in early October last fall or mid-October. So I'm going to, let's, let's guess early October. Okay. Safe guess. Safe guess. <laughs> I know. I'm not going to say November. No, no. November's probably a little bit too late, at least right now. So one thing I was wondering, Stephanie, you know, with some of these old photos um, dating back to Kodachrome days and, and the, the last century, do you worry about um, the colors fading and, and what you see in the photos? So once we get farther in the past, it's not, it, it's going to be, end up being a qualitative, the farther back you go, the more qualitative this is going to be. But if we can just say mm, about 50% have changed at this point, about 75%, about 25, we're just going to broadly try and bin these um, photos and the foliage in these photos into categories and not do crazy color analysis because of just that, right? Like there's so many old filters and lenses and time just wears on photos. So we're just, the farther back we go, the more, qual the more of an art form this data analysis will be. Well, and, and conversely with today's smartphones and, and DSLRs and 
Adobe Photoshop. I mean, people can really manipulate the colors too. Is that a concern? Oh yeah. So great. That, thank you for bringing that up. We ask for your unfiltered photos. Your, I bet you can filter your photo and it will look amazing on Instagram, but we want that raw data. Um, that, thank you so much for bringing that up because yes, you can manipulate it and then hang it on your wall and it'll be beautiful. But I, we're looking for that raw data that will help us out more than your, I'm going to put a sepia filter on this. <laughs> Now, if you look at the big climate change picture, in the years to come, forests in Acadia and other national parks could see a turnover in tree species. That, that could also change the fall color show as well, couldn't it? Yeah. So this is this is a little outside the realm of what I'm what I what I'm doing. But yeah, I, you're. I think you're totally right. So if we think of species like the white birch or the paper birch, they have these great yellow leaves in the fall. Um, but there are cold climate species, and they're primarily found in Canada and the bordering states, so where Maine is. So you can think that is whether or is climate, excuse me, gets warmer, that birch is not going to be able to succeed in a warmer in a warmer Maine. So it actually might be pushed upward. Whereas trees like the um, red maple tree, their range is from southern Florida and all the way up to Maine. Maine is more at like the northern distribution of their species range. So as climate get warmer, we might actually see the yellows of the birches moving upward into Canada and a lot more reds. You can, we can think of it that way. Like where are the cold climate species, where are the warm climate species, and which ones are gonna take over? So we might expect that to happen. And then there's the timing of things. Like I said earlier, different species respond differently to different stressors. So that might affect, what if the maples start their fall, what if, what if it all goes out of sync, right? That would be an interesting thing too. What do you mean going out of sync? So now they're all timed to sort, if they all have different cues, some, some species are cued by, okay, the days are getting shorter. I'm going to shut this photosynthesis down. And that's when the other pigments show up. Um, some species are cued by temperature. So depending on the, which species have the bigger, if, temper, if species are more responsive to temperature versus day length, that might also affect when they start to change color and it might they're all sort of they all sort of occur at the same time right now but you could maybe think if climate becomes a little bit more variable they might not all start changing color within that same two-week window that makes sense yeah yeah it does it does we've been talking with uh, stephanie spira an assistant professor of geography at the university of richmond and a 2019 second century stewardship fellow at the scudic institute at acadia national park she's been looking into fall foliage colors at acadia and uh, relying on you the general public to submit your um, family photos of fall months spent in uh, acadia national park to try and discern uh, if the color seasons are changing at acadia um, stephanie where again can folks send their photos Oh, yeah, it's ANP Fall Foliage at richmond.edu. You could also get info on my website, which is stephaniespera.com slash ANP Fall Foliage. And then the Instagram is at ANP Fall Foliage. So basically, if you type the, wor the words ANP Fall Foliage into Google, hopefully everything about this project shows up. And maybe there you'll you make go. a Facebook page. <laughs> Maybe you'll make a Facebook page, and in the meantime, maybe you'll be buried with submissions, so you'll have a, a really good data set to look at. That's the dream. That's truly the dream, to work Olivia <laughs> really hard. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Stephanie, and we look forward to uh, some inklings of, of what your findings are turning up. Thanks for having me, Kurt. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Hi 
everyone, my name is Erica Zambello, and today I'm here with Dr. Caroline Stahala, an expert on the Bahama parrot. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Erica. So first of all, what is the Bahama parrot? You know, what are we talking about here? Sure. So the Bahama parrot is, and let's get a little scientific. Its scientific name is Amazona leucocephala bahamensis. And what that means to us generally is it's an Amazon parrot. And that doesn't refer to where it lives. That refers to what type of bird it is. So you've probably seen um, green parrots that are about medium size. They're not tiny. They're not macaw size. They're, they're about medium size. They have a short tail, fairly hefty bill. That's what an Amazon parrot is. And um, the Bahama parrot is one of these types of Amazon parrots. And we refer to it as the Bahama parrot. It is part of a larger Amazon parrot complex that we refer to as the Cuban Amazon. So there are other birds that look very, very similar to the Bahama parrot in the Cayman Islands and in Cuba. And so uh, the parrots from these three countries are sort of lumped together as the Cuban Amazon. And more specifically then in the Bahamas, we refer to that particular subspecies as the Bahama parrot. And what do they look like? Let's see. They are mostly green. Then they have a white cap, which is where the term leucocephala comes from, that's white head. And then they have this bright red chest and possibly breast. They're fairly spectacular looking and, you know, with all those, the colorations. They do have some blue in the wings as well, which is particularly noticeable when they're flying. I've actually seen Bahama parrots before. I was visiting, they were so awesome. I was visiting a national park in Abaco, mm -hmm. and that is one of the places where they live. So can you talk a little bit about how other people might see their own Bahama parrot? You know, where, where do they live? Sure. So as I mentioned, um, within the Bahamas, um, you'll find the Bahama parrot. But more specifically, they're found on two islands. And they're found on Great Abaco Island, in, primarily in the southern part of the island, where the Abaco National Park is, which is probably where you were. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's where they nest. So they're in that area primarily during the summer. And then the other island that they're on is Great Inagua Island. Um, Great Inagua is much less populated. Uh, the conditions are slightly harsher. Um, you'll see more stunted trees. Uh, it's a lot hotter at time year round. Um, Abaco has a much milder climate. It, it's a little bit more temperate than than Great Inagua further south. Uh, and both of those islands have parks that have um, parrots within them. Um, so if you're not able to get to Great Abaco to go see them because of the hurricane, go ahead and head down to Great Inagua. You're gonna see parrots, flamingos, and a whole bunch of other bird species that it, it, it's really a fantastic place. So Bahama parrots, I mean, like you said, they look like parrots, but it's really <laughs> their, their nesting habits that set them apart from other bird species, right? Right, so the, Abaco population exhibits a, a unique uh, nesting behavior when compared to other parrots. Most of the time parrots nest in a cavity within a tree and that cavity could have been made by another bird. Uh, maybe a woodpecker started it and then it slowly got bigger and bigger and then the parrots were able to use it. Um, it could have been a natural cavity where a branch had fallen off and um, by virtue of the tree starting to rot, it created a hole for the birds to use. But the abaco population actually nests underground in limestone solution cavities. Wow. It's, yeah, it's, they actually go underground into caves, which is really unique and a really cool behavior. 
and it's actually an advantage for them on Abaco. So why, so why, can you talk a little bit more about why it's an advantage? What's the advantage of nesting underground? Right. To me, it um, seems a little cold so, and damp. <laughs> um, those trees that we were talking about tend to be uh, the limiting factor for a lot of paired populations around the world. So if they don't have enough nesting trees or enough cavities within these trees to nest in, you know, they will try to find other places to nest, but that usually limits how many individuals can reproduce. These holes in the ground on Abaco are superfluous, so they are everywhere. If you walk through the pine, pine forest out there, you are bound to step in a hole. <laughs> and when these holes are just right for the parrots, that means there's a certain opening size, then um, and it's you know certain depth and this actually varies quite a bit we have had some nest cavities that were only about two feet deep and as deep as uh almost seven feet so you know this range it's it's not a very narrow range that they, they, they can use a lot of different hole sizes you know let's say about the the opening is about the size of your head or so, <laughs> just to make it easy. And what happens is because there's so many holes out there, that's not what's limiting their population growth, which is great because, you know, that's, it's really hard to replicate or provide them with enough places to nest. So since they have that on Abaco, that is absolutely fantastic. Gotcha. So we're going to talk about Hurricane Dorian in a second, but you've studied the Bahama parrot for years as part of your graduate work, and they were in trouble before Hurricane Dorian, right? Yes, and the irony is they were actually starting to come back. So we were having success with the management that the Bahamas National Trust was implementing for the parrots. So um, to go back, uh, yes, I started my master's work on the Bahama parrot as part of a project that the actually current director of the National Trust uh, really worked hard to implement. And that was looking at the demography, uh, basically what happens through the life cycle of a Bahama parrot. And that means, um, you know, how many chicks are produced, uh, how many adults and chicks survive during the year, and um, you know what are some of the limiting factors here? We talked about the nest cavities not being a limiting factor, but what what really is? And during that time, what we found out was even though this underground nesting behavior is is actually a you know super adaptation to this habitat and environment it does pose a particular challenge, which is introduced mammals to the island were able to predate on these birds. Okay. What we're finding was introduced cats primarily were killing adults or, and, and breeding adults, which is particularly significant, and entire broods of chicks inside these nest cavities. So what we ended up doing was proposing a um, control effort to manage predation and manage cats on the island. So the Bahamas National Trust, um, you know, they ran with it, they implemented it. And what we have found is that the population size of uh, the Abaco parrot has steadily increased since they implemented that management. So here we're seeing um, success of management you know, for this one particular bird population. And then Hurricane Dorian hit. Yes. Right. So I'm sure everyone has seen the, the really horrific images. Hurricane Dorian smashed into the Bahamas and was just both a large and also a very slow moving hurricane, which brought particular devastation to the communities that lived on Abaco and in the Bahamas. But of course, 
it also has a very negative effect on the wildlife populations too. So what are you hearing about the fate of the Bahama parrot after Hurricane Dorian? Right. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Our hearts go out to everybody that lived there. I have friends that, you know, I immediately wanted to check on and make sure they were okay. Communication was spotty for a long time, but at this point, um, I have been able to uh, at least hear about most of my friends from the island. So um, yeah, our hearts go out to them. And unfortunately, the eye of the hurricane did hit the most populated part of the island, which is central and northern Abaco and the outlying keys. And the parrots that we're talking about, their primary habitat is further south. And so the impacts from the storm were not quite as severe in that part of the island, in the southern part of the island, as they were in the central and northern part of the island. So um, what we've, the you know pictures I've been getting back and reports is that the forests in those areas have not been as severely impacted as, as central and northern Abaco have, which, you know, that's, that provides us a little bit of buffer for having um, to do any sort of management on, on that parrot population, because obviously focus right now is on um, trying to help the people who have stayed on the island. Absolutely. And so, you know, as rescue and recovery efforts are going on for the human populations, what's next for the Bahama parrot? You know, if people are interested in helping, what can they do? Right. So a couple of things. Um, We have been working with the Bahamas National Trust, which is the island's um, forest service, park service, and sort of fish and wildlife service all uh, rolled into one. Um, So they're leading the effort on um, management uh, in general. Uh, I mentioned that they had done the predator control work earlier on to bring back the numbers. Well, it's still their role to uh, manage these populations of wildlife on the island after the storm. So once they get back on their feet, the idea is to go out and survey and these are going to be comprehensive surveys, not just of parrots, but habitat, um, other bird species, because there are some other unique bird species on the island. Basically take a whole inventory of what the impacts were. And from there, we can then go into management and see, okay, what do we need to do next? And the intensity and impact of this storm certainly was unprecedented in the fact that it was, if we could call it a category six hurricane, because it was well above uh, the base levels of a cat five. Those in, you know, the impact it made to uh, central and northern Abaco are, are certainly unprecedented. However, hurricanes in general are not unusual to this part of the world. And we've had enough information from previous hurricanes that have hit our parrot population as well as parrot populations on other islands throughout the Caribbean that we know what to expect. And because the intensity of the storm where the parrots were found was less than, you know, the the Cat 6 that hit Central Abaco, we're fairly comfortable in saying they, the birds still have enough food available to them for the time being to survive. Now, what we have seen from previous storms is that vegetation tends to drop its leaves and fruits due to some of the stress that it's gone through over the course of a few months and then progressively starts to um, relief and uh, provide food again for these birds, but there may be a time period where the, you know, the food availability is low. We're not um, 
too concerned that the primary impact was as severe on the parrots. And by that, I mean the storm actually killing parrots as it goes over. Right. Like the wind and, and the falling right. and things like that. Exactly. Exactly. So we're, we're comfortable that the parrot population is okay, but you know, we've got to see, are they going to have the resources they need to continue moving forward? Gotcha. Well, we will definitely stay up to date with you and, and see how it goes for the Bahama parrots. And, you know, if you go and visit, we'd love to hear a report back. But thank you so much for talking to us and giving us kind of the lay of the land with the Bahama parrots. In the midst of all that devastation in Abaco, it seems like they might be a small silver lining. Yeah, we're hoping. Thanks, Erica. I appreciate your interest. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Legislation to provide as much as $6.5 billion to the National Park Service to help whittle away the agency's roughly $12 billion maintenance backlog died in Congress at the end of 2018. It was reintroduced earlier this year as the Restore Our Parks Act with support from both Republicans and Democrats what are its odds of passage in the current session? For an update, we've reached out to Rebecca Knufke at the Pew Charitable Trusts, where she works on the Restore America's Parks Initiative. Thanks for making time for us, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Kurt. So could you give me a a quick uh, update on where the legislation stands? Certainly. As it did last session, this legislation enjoys tremendous bipartisan support. Uh, almost three quarters of the House and more than a third of the Senate are supporting legislation to fix our parks. In the House, um, it's recently passed this summer, the House Natural Resources Committee, uh, with a resounding vote of 36 to 2. And in the Senate, um, it awaits action in um, its committee of jurisdiction, and we are hoping that will come up soon. Has it um, been scheduled or is it just kind of waiting there for um, the the speaker, the majority leader to put it on the calendar? It is a waiting action. Exactly. It's a waiting action um, by the speaker to put it on the calendar. Okay. Is there a companion measure in the Senate or do they have to wait for this version from the House to come over? Nope, there is a companion version. Um, both the House and the Senate version passed out of their respective committees last session. Um, and so the same bills were reintroduced in the, both the House and the Senate. And we're waiting for the committee, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee uh, in the Senate to, to take it up. And have they put it on the calendar yet or is that still up in the air? Still up in the air. Any idea why um, it seems to be dragging along? Yeah, I think we actually have tremendous momentum um, for it to move forward. You know, the Senate has been very busy with confirmation hearings. They've just had a, a long list of things that they've needed to attend to. Um, but it's, I think, very much on the minds of the legislators to try to move it forward. Do you have any concerns? I mean, we're going into what looks like another budget battle um, later this fall. And then the election year is uh, surprisingly right around the corner. Um Are you concerned that those two things might slow it down? I think this is moving on a very positive track. Uh, I think it's mainly, you know, if we can get through some of the work in the period, um, we will continue to move this forward. It has tremendous support. Um, To give you an idea, to put it sort of in more context, what that support means, um, we... 
this bill with 307 co-sponsors in the House is uh, one of only seven authorizing bills not already enacted with equal or greater number of co-sponsors out of 9,400 pieces of legislation. Wow, that is pretty impressive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. Is, is it join, enjoying similar uh, um, support in the Senate? Yes, we have um, in the Senate, you know, a third supporting the legislation, which is also terrific. Okay. Now, I'm a little hazy on my, my congressional calendars. Um, does it have to get passed this year or can it carry over into the, the 2020 year or would it have to be reintroduced? It would need to be reintroduced, uh, which, you know, it was this year. Um, so that would be no problem if for some reason um, parts of it got punted into next year. It would be just be reintroduced. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, all the best with uh, your efforts to see it move through Congress, and hopefully we'll soon see it come up on the, the Senate and the House floors. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. For suggestions on future shows, you can reach us at news at nationalparkstraveler.org. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Rebencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.